I'm recording. Everyone give us a clap. Better clap. A better clap? It's my favorite part of the podcast is the clap. <laughs> That's a good clap. Welcome to The Old Man of the Three with J.J. Reddick and Tommy Alter, brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 183, Adam Silver. Tommy, very blessed that uh, Commissioner Silver gave us uh, some time last week. We recorded on Thursday. A um, lot to get into with him. Uh, before we go there, let's talk DraftKings Sportsbook. And I want to talk about the in-season tournament. Yeah. Early impressions. I got to call Friday's game in Milwaukee against the Knicks. Early impressions from you as a fan. What do you think? So I'm a fan of the tournament. I'm happy that it's happening. I have a question. I have my own comments on this. I have a question before we get into the basketball. I want to know what your favorite and least favorite court is. Because that was the first. Yeah. I I think I was uh, not appreciating enough how fucking crazy they were going to (laughs) look. And Friday so, night came, and I well, here's like, the what thing. Is I, my, so, my impression of the court in person, like I walked out on the court uh, to get in the booth and do the pregame stuff, and you know, check my my, this talk, is in my Milwaukee. talk back. Yeah, in Milwaukee. And like Milwaukee's court, relative to the other 29 teams, is pretty tame. It's just a variation of uh, the Cream City court, essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was pretty tame. Um, obviously, not all the teams have played. Uh, on TV yet with the courts. We've seen pictures of all 30. Um, of the teams that played, the two that really stood out that I'm like, these are awesome. The Indiana Pacers. The Pacers one is crazy. The Pacers awesome. one is really cool. With the with the lightish royal blue and the yellow streak. Come on, man. It kind of looks sick. like it's one of the, it's like on a boat or something. Like yes. it doesn't it doesn't uh, even fit with Indiana. And then I liked uh, you know I watched uh I watched the fourth quarter of the uh the OKC game and uh that was awesome. Yeah. Love the OKC court. That was great. The sack one is beautiful. Yeah. The sack one is beautiful. The Portland one weirdly works, even though it has, even though it's red. Which I was going to say, my the Bulls is my least favorite. I was, so you I, like the Portland one, but you because the because the Portland, you like the Bulls one. Of course, you like the Bulls one. No, I don't sense. like the Bulls one. I hate the Bulls one. I think the I think the Bulls one looks like it's like a court in hell. Like it's literally it's because it's all red. It's all red, and the Portland one has Rip City on it. It has like red elements, but it's yeah. not. So I feel like that. The other one, did you see the Pelicans one? Yeah, I liked it. You didn't like it? No. No. I, no. It's just purple doesn't work. Purple doesn't work. I will say, though, I mean, I guess, like, what do you think about this? I like the idea that they're doing this in general, though, because it's very controversial. I think it does get people talking and differentiating between these games because I don't know otherwise how fans are going to notice the difference. Right. I, I I like the play from the NBA here. Um I'm I'm actually, you know, we, we talked a ton about the tournament on the broadcast. I, I think RJ's co- opening comment in the intro is is so spot on. He, sa- he said something along the lines of, uh, you know, hey, America, welcome to something the rest of the world is very familiar with. Because in leagues, in a, a number of sports across the world, this is normal yeah. throughout a calendar year. Um, good on the NBA for trying it. Um, My other point, which is a point I've made frequently over the last seven to ten days, these these pool play games, the group play games, they count. They're regular season games. They count twice, essentially. You add the court. You add the home team rocking the city jerseys. I, I love the feeling as a player of, like, this is an event. Like, even to the point where I, we, I did the global games in China three times. Going over there and, like, playing in front of those fans – the uh, the events around just being there, like you get up for that stuff. If I did a preseason game at home versus going and playing in China, in Shanghai or Shenzhen or wherever, like there's a big difference. There's energy. There's energy. There's energy. And I, and I and I I feel like this is going to be a great thing, particularly if we're thinking about this sort of strategically, particularly in the middle of the NFL season. Yeah. It's something to talk about. Like most people don't pay attention to the NBA until the NFL season is over. That's a fact. Like let's wait till December 10th, December 11th when we get into the finals and see where the buzz is because I think it's going to be pretty high. Well, that's the other point is like the the Vegas part. Like if you're a player, if you're a team, if you're a fan of one of those teams, you get the opportunity to have like a true full-on event outside of just a home game with a different court and a different uniform. You get to go to Vegas. You know, we've all seen some of those summer league crowds – Vegas is a great basketball city. Yeah. You know, they 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 host the biggest AAU tournament outside of maybe the Peach Jam in in, in the country and they get 
lots of attention around these things. This is actual regular season NBA action. Of course, the championship game won't count, but uh, I, I'm I'm a fan did, of this whole thing to start. Did you see what what Tyrese said about the automatic bid? Uh, yes. I don't want to spoil it. We did discuss this with Adam. Uh, we'll let Adam Fair. put it in his Fair. words. That's the, Fast forward um, if you want to. But we, we talked to him around just the incentives around the um, the in season tournament. Uh, the other court I like, which we haven't seen yet, uh, San Antonio Spurs. I'm a fan of that court. Very curious to see what it looks like on camera. Um, one comment left on the court and the jerseys. I get some frustration because I saw a lot of discourse around this uh, on social media. I get the frustration with. Uh, changing jerseys every year. Um, and I don't know if like the league does this, but like to me, you know, you, the home and away jerseys, you vary it. You do a city edition jersey, like great. There needs to be an icon jersey. Like what is the best Indiana Pacers jersey of all time? All right. Let the fans, let the Pacers fans vote on it. Yeah. Let them vote on it. What is the best Phoenix Suns jersey of all time? What is the best Blazers jersey of all time? Whatever it may be. That's the icon jersey, and that stays year to year. Yeah, I would love that. Keep a little continuity. Yeah, a little continuity. A little yeah. continuity. What do you think of these uh, of the DraftKings? I have a couple of thoughts on this and these in season tournament odds. So, lots of ways to get in on the action here, <laughs> using the tagline. Yeah. Um, I, I think what's interesting you can you can bet on the group play winner, and you know a couple things that pop right away. East Group A Pacers right now with the best odds at plus 210. Philly, who's playing unbelievable basketball, will play their first in-season tournament group play game on Tuesday night. By the time this comes out, they'll have already played it. Uh, but they're in second in that group at plus 215. Uh, and then the other one is the Group B winner, which the Nuggets are playing unbelievable basketball right there, right now. Relative to some of the other groups, i.e. East Group B, with Milwaukee at, uh, at a minus 135 and Golden State at a minus 105, you can actually bet on the Nuggets and make some money here. They're at plus 105. Seems crazy. Group C, the West Group C is fucking stacked. The West Group C, yeah. Warriors, Wolves, Thunder, Kings, Spurs. That's fun. <laughs> That's fucking stacked. That's fun. I think I was looking at I'm the so into this. Like, I I really am. And we were, we, we me in particular, uh, but a lot of players, we were uh, against the play-in. Yeah, when it was the announced. The play-in's been awesome. The play-in's been awesome. Yeah. And my only thing, I have no prediction on this, is we always, you, you have an idea and, and you see how it plays out. You don't know the, the like, everything in the NBA. We talked about this with Zach Lowe. Everything in the NBA has an unintended consequence. I'm curious to see if there is an unintended consequence of this group play game, other than people potentially burning some of these jerseys. Well, here's a question, and I wanted to talk about sleepers overall, not not in the specific groups. Do you do you think that there's like we talked when we when, when Cam Johnson came on and we talked about like the bubble run that the Suns had and how uh, basically that sort of gelled them into sure. what they became? Is there a world where there's a team and we can talk about a few options who? maybe is not a top five team right now that goes on a run in this tournament. And then all of a sudden they're the Kings from last year. You know, they're the, they're the team that they winning with stakes turns them into a group that, you know, they, they might, it might've taken them a little longer to get to that place if they were not, if they didn't have, you know, a, a run like this. Yeah, Let's go, let's go outside of the obvious teams. So you said top five. Well, Seventh in odds right now is the Clippers. Just traded for James Harden. Uh, I love the Philly play with the way they're playing basketball right now. They're next, uh, so they have the eighth best odds. You go further down, you, you get to the Hawks, uh, the Timberwolves, the Kings, all right around sort of the 15th best odds. Uh, so those type of teams, like the Timberwolves to me, with the way they're defending right now, yeah, that's, they're playing that's... really good basketball. Um, they're an interesting team. Uh, you know, and it, one other thing about the odds, just real quick, because you can obviously bet on uh, the the finals winner, and you know some of the teams like the Celtics, Bucks, Denver, all that stuff. You're not getting like necessarily great odds, but on the in season tournament winner, I mean the the Nuggets and the Celtics have the the best odds at plus seven fifty. I was you, wondering, you got action. I was wondering why the Timberwolves were so low, but I'm now thinking about it. It might just be because of that group. Yeah. Because you're betting because yeah. of who they have to sort of play in this thing, and I, and look, I, I think if you're looking at it, um, you know, from from a product standpoint, if you're a viewer, 
and you're watching these games, I, you know, the, the Knicks uh, games are never pretty, but we got a great game Friday night. Yeah. Right. Uh, second game was great. That OKC Golden State game was awesome. Um, we're getting competitive basketball. And, and truthfully, since, you know, probably the last week in the buildups up to some of this, and uh, you, you go across the league and you're, the players have been asked about this stuff, the active players, they all seem genuinely excited about it. And so if you have buy-in from the players, you're going to get a good product and a good result. What about the Magic at plus 4,500? To win it all? I'm good on that. No, I'm, I, don't, I don't need to spend money. <laughs> I want a deep sleeper. I want to cr- like that. Scared, would be, but, scared money don't make but money. But that would though. be amazing. It would be amazing money. if a team like the Magic won it. And the Magic have had a great start to the season. And I'm not saying the Magic are going to win it. I'm, I don't think they're going to win their group. But I'm yeah. saying like that to me is best case scenario is the Magic or the Timberwolves winning. I can't Bo- wait. I'm just Boston. Like Boston's probably going to win. Boston, wow, Denver, Boston yeah. or Denver are probably going to win. I think that's a fair. That's a fair assumption. But I'm saying it would be great for this if one of those teams did not. I think those teams are going to be playing in the finals. But it would be great if there was a a random team yeah. like OKC or Orlando that went on a run and won it. I think what's cool about the way they did it at the beginning of the season, if you think about this, so you have the teams who potentially like just made trades, right? The 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 Bucks, for instance. Obviously, uh, Celtics made a trade right before the season as well. Clippers, all that stuff. But, but by and large, you know, you have like the the build up from uh, September preseason training camp, NBA preseason, early season teams trying to figure out their rhythm. And like, there's this like marker, uh, the the in season tournament winner. There's that's a marker, right? That's a thing. And then you get further on, you get into January. Everybody wants the All Star break to come. And then there's the trade deadline, and then teams try to figure it out after trade deadline. Then you get to the play. So it's like it's almost like it's this own separate part of the season that hasn't existed before. Yeah, where you're playing for something. I love it. And you look back, and you you could look back and you'd be like, oh, this this team won the in season tournament, and then. They cratered in March and <laughs> in April and ended up in the it. play-in. That was it. They just wanted the 500 grand and then they <laughs> yeah. bailed. I like that the Heat are plus 1,800. They're like It's like the Heat, playoff Heat has seeped into the betting yeah, of yeah. in-season tournament. They're above They're above teams like Minnesota and Dallas that have played great. Uh, before before we get to Adam, I, real quick, because I get, I'm at uh, uh, Knox and Kai's uh, flag football game on Saturday. Uh, Kai played first. Two picks. Two picks uh, and a touchdown. Six catches. Balled out. Uh, and then Kai, by the way, had 15 points. I coached him yesterday morning. He had 15 points. 15 of his 17 points hit the game winner with a minute to go. God, kid's an athlete. Anyways, I'm at the <laughs> I'm at these black football games, and all the dads are like, I just I just don't understand the in-season tournament. And I'm like, well, a quick Google search can explain it in about 30 seconds. Do you not understand it or do you not want to understand it? Because it's very simple. It's very simple. It's we very took simple. the records from last year. We divided the conferences into three groups. Obviously, there's 15 teams in each conference, so three groups of five. Everybody plays everybody else, so there's four group play games over the next four weeks. The winners of each group, that's six, go to the quarterfinals. The teams with the next two, next two best records, one in each conference, goes to the quarterfinals. Then you play those seedings, right? The four teams that win, they go to the finals in Vegas, all right? Semifinals, finals. Finals doesn't count towards the regular season. Everything else counts towards the regular season. It's very, it's that simple. Did you say it this calmly to the dads, or did you raise your voice? No, I told all the dads I'm trying to watch my kid play. Can Shut you please, <laughs> can you please a, just hit a quick leave, Google search? Leave me alone. <laughs> in season tournament explainer. It's very quick. I did that in 30 seconds. All right. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments. <laughs> all right. This has been our DraftKings Sportsbook segment. Basketball is more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JJ. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort, Kansas, 21 and over age varies by jurisdiction. Void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. 
Uh, really excited about this interview, guys. Again, Adam Silver, very busy. I don't want to promise anything, but after this interview, I think there's a good chance that we can get on with Adam a couple of times a season for check-ins. Uh, we covered a lot. There's a lot we didn't cover. Uh, we had a, a time stipulation that we actually went over. Adam uh, gave us about 45 minutes. He was only supposed to give us about 30 minutes. So very excited uh, to give you guys this interview. And uh, without further ado, our conversation with NBA Commissioner Adam Silver. Adam, thanks for doing this. Uh, we are here at uh, the NBA offices in Midtown. Uh, we apologize to the viewer uh, and the listener. If there is any uh, sirens or construction noise, this is uh, Midtown Manhattan. There is noise. Uh, but really appreciate you doing this, man. Absolutely. Thanks for coming here. Yeah. Um, you know, I know we have a limited amount of time here, so I want to dive into it. But I actually wanted to ask you about time first, because I, I, I think a lot of people, including me, are curious about how you relegate your time. You have a lot of responsibilities, I assume. There's a lot of people you have to talk to between uh, players, the union, owners, agents, brand partners, watching basketball, attending games. Uh, how do you go about prioritizing your time? It's a great question. And it's something I think about all the time. And here come the sirens. <laughs> you know, I used to joke, like I've lived in New York City most of my life. And uh, in the old days when people used to have regular answering machines at their apartments, that there was always a siren behind everybody's answering machine. So here it goes. So, uh, you know, in, in terms of my time, I, I, in what I enjoy so much about my job is that I love every aspect. And I remember Jerry Reinsdorf, Years ago, um, the l owner of the Chicago Bulls, he asked me to do something and I was hemming and hawing and he, and he stopped. He said, Adam, he said, I'm going to give you some advice. I said, what's that, Jerry? He said, no is the second best answer. <laughs> and, and it's part of it in time management. One of the tricks is frankly, learning what to say no to and saying no early because it actually helps the person who's asking you as well. And I also got married late. I have young children. So trying to balance that among all the other things you talked about. And I, I also find that creating discipline where your inbox doesn't run your life because that's easy too. That there's a way that that ends up setting priorities that aren't real. It's just because it was the last email that comes in. And yet I've always wanted to be that guy that gets back fairly quickly to people on email. And I'm learning that I can't necessarily do that either. So I, the, the, the truth is I got great colleagues. I, I do try to do some planning. Uh, incidentally, um, Marty Dempsey, the former joint chief of staff, who's now become an advisor to the league. I remember when I first met with him at the Pentagon, when he was very close to coach K and was still in his position, he showed me how he did his schedule. I, I, I it was the period be right before I became commissioner and he was explaining all these complicated color coding. I mean, granted, I don't want to compare myself as the joint chief of staff, but you know, each region of the world. I spend this much time. I spend this much time doing these things. I've never gotten to that point where I'm that organized, but I, um, you know, I do think a lot about our teams and making sure looking at a calendar, I try to get to every market now that, you know, your travel obviously as a former player that may seem that automatic if you're the commissioner, but when you start looking at, you know, so it's, I guess it's 28 markets, 30 teams that it's, it's harder than it seems sometimes to coordinate all that, to make sure you show up everywhere, to make sure I'm checking in on a regular basis with the team governors, with the team presidents, with the GMs, our players association. In some cases, I talk directly to certain players on the executive committee. You were very involved in the players association when you were there. So it, this is a long winded way of saying, I try to do it in a structured way, but despite whatever discipline I try to put in place, I end up occasionally getting pulled into things. And I just say, lastly, I think that's the other thing I have to be careful of. Let's say we're going through a collective bargaining cycle and we just did that. It, I can't stop everything else and spend all my time on that because obviously the business has to move forward. Right now, the, the biggest issue the league is, is confronting is the expiration of our media deals. So that should and is my highest priority, but things have a way of just happening on our calendar. You know, it, at every morning, you know, there's incidents on the floor. People want to talk about them. So it, it's a lot. No, I'm sure it is. And, and it's interesting because um, I think, there, there's the, 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 the nine to five job. And as a professional athlete, you, you don't have a nine to five job. Your schedule, especially in season is very random. And I tried to implement as much structure as possible. And I assume in, in your uh, position, there's a lot of randomness to your schedule and whatnot. Um, 
I, I think about, um, as a follow-up to this question, I, I think a lot about uh, organizations, uh, even teams, professional sports teams that have like mission statements. And when I think about my career, uh, in some ways, like I, I had a personal mission statement while I played. Uh, now, as a, as a person in the media, there's a there's a personal sort of mission statement, and so it, it goes back to that idea of prioritizing. Like when you get up in the morning, the the mindset around the singular focus of like what it is you're trying to do. What is that? To me, it's to grow the game of basketball. I mean, one of the benefits to being on the top of the pyramid of globe of the global game is that virtually everything that happens around the game in a positive way accrues essentially or, or over time to the NBA's benefit. To the extent that more kids, boys and girls, whether it's through the NBA or the WNBA, became, become interested in our league, play the game of basketball, um, play basketball video games, you know, engage in social media around the game, all that to me is it's largely positive for the game. I mean, you and I could go on. There's some bad aspects of that, of course. But to me, what, and, and I have to remind myself, and it's, I like the way you put the question because I've lost my focus along the way as well. And we should talk a little bit about that. Sort of my theme for this season is back to basketball in some ways, that the game is at the core of everything we do. And, and to me, having that discipline to be thinking every morning that as I look out at my day, what am I doing that's focused on the game itself, um, improving interest in the game, in improving the quality of play? There's all these wonderful things that have happened around the business and outside the business, but it's, it, you know, including the, the massive interest in social media with our players and thing, everything about basketball. But I often have to remind myself that all stems from the quality of play on the floor, the quality of the competition. Yeah, you bring up social media, and I was going to ask you about this later, but I'll, I'll do it now because, uh, you know, the NBA Twitter uh, is is such an interesting place. I don't know how much time you spend online. How often does uh, a meme, uh, a conversation, uh, whether it's positive or negative, but when when things happen on NBA Twitter that go viral, how often does that come across your desk? Very often, because we have great communications um, department here, and we live in the world. And even to the extent there are, it's a meme or it's a theme on social media, I find that we need to enter the conversation. In some cases, if it's factually wrong, um, to do our best we can to, to correct the record. Um, in some cases to try as best we can to guide the conversation and in, in, in other instances to react to the conversation. And to your point, I mean, NBA Twitter is real. I mean, it's, it's a humongous audience of people. In fact, you know, Twitter or X told us recently, I mean, sports is the number one category of content on that service. I think people might think it's politics or fashion or something else, but it's actually sports and it really not just the NBA, of course, but, but drives that platform as is the case for Instagram and a lot of the other social media platforms. But it's part of, I think my job to see if we can harness it to our advantage, because there's also enormous amount of negativity out there. I think that, and, and I, I also see as my job both, um, to provide some, I would say guardrails for players, you know, entering social media, but also be protective to the extent we can as well, because it's, as you know, I mean, our, our players are in many cases sort of young folks who are sensitive. And as you of course, well know for any fan who thinks that's not the case, they're just off, you know, that, and I, and I'm always sort of as an outsider to most locker rooms amazed when I hear that guys are actually looking at their phones at halftime. I'm like, because I don't even like there are things that I do that I find that it's incredibly distracting, you know, even during the draft, if I'm, you know, <laughs> if I'm on social media and somebody's making fun of me or <laughs> laughing about like the way I pronounce the name, I'm like, it, I find that incredibly distracting. I'm like, don't show it to me. I'll, I'll read it later. But I, I pay attention to it. I think it's my job to pay attention to it. NBA fans, the wait is over, basketball is back, and DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA, is celebrating with an unbeatable offer. 
new customers can score $200 in bonus bets for throwing down $5 on the NBA. Win or lose, it doesn't matter. You'll start the season with an instant dub. And with DraftKings parlays, everyone's got a shot at even bigger basketball wins. String together multiple bets from the same game or build your parlay across multiple games for a shot at making your payday even sweeter. Basketball's more fun when you're in on the action. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JJ. New customers can get $200 in bonus bets instantly for betting just $5. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code JJ. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit www.1800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY-467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort Kansas, licensee partner Golden Nugget Lake Charles, Louisiana, 21 and over, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See sportsbook.draftkings.com slash basketball terms for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Being a former athlete, I know a thing or two about the importance of proper hydration, but I'll be honest, I had no idea how important it is to stay hydrated as a podcaster. Uh, I'm not joking. Don't laugh. We often stack recordings back to back. It's hours and hours of talking and listening, and it can be surprisingly exhausting. But that's why I'm all in on Smart Water Alkaline to get me through my long work days. Smart Water Alkaline is premium vapor distilled bottled water with added electrolytes for a pure, crisp taste. Smart Water Alkaline was truly made to support active lifestyles, which is fantastic because after these long recordings, I'm often headed straight to coach my kids' basketball teams or calling a game, and having Smart Water Alkaline with me is about as crucial as having my phone on me. Plus, it doesn't hurt that the bottle looks really sharp. Smart Water Alkaline is the hydration choice for people looking to elevate in all areas of their lives. So do yourself a favor and be sure to grab a bottle today. Smart Water Alkaline is available at a store near you. Well, one of the reasons I bring this up, and in some ways I do think uh, X or NBA Twitter or whatever, um, in some ways, and I don't know the actual statistics, you may know this about the participants around NBA discourse. You know, how many people... Uh, watch games, how many people are, are are streaming games, how many people are listening to podcasts, how many people are participating on NBA Twitter. I don't know this, but in, in some ways, uh, NBA Twitter is a, is a good uh, customer service survey. You know, you're, you're getting feedback. And ultimately, I think, I, I would assume you're then making decisions or trying to make decisions around that feedback. How much did the discourse around load management influence the decisions made and and the new policies in place around resting players, end of season awards, all of those things? So my quick answer is it had a huge influence on me and on the league. I would just say in terms of social media specifically, and I think this is the challenge for anyone who's overseeing a business or a brand that has a large audience, is to try to separate sort of what the majority view is or what you know what what are the 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 trends and and the themes that you should follow as opposed to what are the extremes i mean and i follow politics closely just as particular you know my personal interest and i i think i sometimes think about the way political discourse goes on social media and it's pretty apparent it represents the extremes in most cases and i think again back to the nba I find that I have to be careful in the same way that I don't want to necessarily let my schedule be dictated by the last email I got, that there may be a particular meme or, or thread on social media, but that it's impacting me disproportionately because it's not necessarily representative of our fans. Now, back to your specific question, I wouldn't just look to social media sure, in terms sure, of sure. player participation. The data is really clear. I mean, when, whether it's, um, secondary market for ticket sales, a, a real-time market in terms of value, whether it's um, minute-by-minute ratings for games, whether it's streaming data. I mean, it's 
it, it's maybe it, it's self-evident, but to the extent a star is not on the floor, and certainly when a star announces or a team announces before the game that that star is not playing, that has a been big impact on the interest. And 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 I think also back to an earlier point where I think that you know I in the league lost its focus a bit is that you know we went down um, that road of so-called load management. There of course is some legitimacy to it. Um, that, but, but, but again, that may be self-evident to a certain extent as well in terms of performance. And I, I, I separate two issues when it comes to load management, there's load management that supposedly can help prevent injuries. And then there's load management. That's purely a performance issue. And again, you can speak far better about the impact of a back to back or four games out of five nights or anything than I can on your body. But I think, again, that's fairly intuitive, even for weekend athletes that if you're tired, you're not going to perform at as high a level. I think where, you know, Joe, Joe Dumars has been speaking to this lately, where we're now starting to really push back hard on some of the data that, that, where the suggestion was that it was that you could prevent injuries from it. I think that the data is very inconclusive there. And, you know, I've read some of the commentary again, back to social media, like, aha, they've discovered religion. They're going into new media negotiations or whatever else. I, you know, frankly, we still have two years left on our existing deals and we're paying attention every day. I think that this is an area where you needed multiple years of data and the trend lines were, were going in the wrong direction. Guys increasingly were, were, were in, we're playing fewer games and fewer minutes. And frankly, like, again, like you don't need a, a super sophisticated analysis to see that it wasn't reducing injuries. I mean, there, there's also, this is more anecdotal, but there's a school of thought too, that particularly from some of the more veteran players or some of the, 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 the retired players that it could even lead to injuries that if you get out of your rhythm, you know, days We've off. We've had a I, number of older yeah, players talk about right. that. Right. And, and again, it's not, I, I think here where you then have to factor in the direct impact it has on the business. And this is a business. And whether it's the economics of ticket sales or uh, ratings and fan interest in the game, or, or frankly, just frustration from fans. Um, I get it. I'm a fan. And also I go to a lot back to, you know, traveling around in my schedule. I go to lots of games. I sit in the stands, just talk to a lot of people or just, you know, anecdotally as I travel around people just grabbing me. The, you know, the player participation policy, the, the load management term has become so negative around the league that they're, yes, like a definitely influenced by the discourse out there and a recognition. Incidentally, again, I, th I haven't seen this as sort of league or team first player. I think that to the credit of the players association and particularly the vets, you know, on the executive committee, when we sat down in collective bargaining, sure, there was some negotiation around what the right number of minimum games for, you know, eligibility for awards, factoring in injuries and everything else. But there seemed to be complete agreement in the room that this was an issue, that this had gone too far and that star players needed to be on the floor unless they were injured. Uh, so question on that point, um, because you know, last All-Star break, I think, you, you said the, the data supports load management, and then the NBA announced, and Joe Dumars gave a bunch of quotes around this earlier this fall, that the data now suggests that load management doesn't really have an effect on injury, which, again, like, you're collecting data in real time. I get all that. I'm not here to point out that you went back on what you said at All-Star break. What I found interesting in Joe's quotes, he talked about slippage, you know, year to year. It's just gotten progressively worse. Um, and then he talked about a culture, a culture around wanting to play 82 games. And I felt this way as a player later in my career, when this word and this concept became uh, popular, I felt, and I still, when I talk to players feel that this is not coming from the players. And you think about the training staffs in 2006, when I entered the league versus the training staffs now, and people feel like, I, I'm not blaming them, I, people feel like they have a job. Oh, you're running hot. We need to sit, sit you out of game. Well, I don't feel like sitting out of game. I want to play, right? And so during those negotiations with the players, did you get that same sense that this is not coming from the players? My sense was, and again, there were team representatives, largely team governors and players in the room. And at the end of the day, I think everyone agreed it was coming from both sides. That yes. Um, the growing training staffs, the computer programs that show he's in the red, et cetera, that that was part of it. But also, and this is, was coming, I'd say more from 
the veteran negotiators that it had become a thing a bit in the, the league. There's a culture around it now. They yeah, got that, introduced that, that and now this is what the younger players are. The younger they... guys. And I think the older guys were saying, all right, we'll take some responsibility for this, but this is ridiculous that the younger guys are now saying, you know, that that's, this should be my designated game not to play. And I just also address your earlier issue. First of all, I, like no embarrassment from me to change my mind. I mean, I think that in terms of leading an organization. Sometimes I look back to a second love is politics where that's always viewed as a negative. If a politician changes his or her mind, I view that as growth, you know, and not necessarily a flip-flop. I will say though, that back to my earlier point, um, I think there is good data in terms of performance. It's pretty definitive. There's no question that a tired player is not going to perform as well as one that's had more rest. And, and, Understandably, I've had conversations with um, coaches like Steve Kerr, for example, um, even very recently about what is the optimal schedule? How many games should we have? Is there magic behind 82 and all that? And I, I don't think we're at the point where the, the data is sufficient where we can say, yes, we would be a better, putting aside the economic sacrifice, that's, that's real, but that we would be a better league at 72 games. It's like, I, th I think there's, a lot of noise around the data on some of those issues and we'll continue to look at it. But yes, I think on, on the injury side, I think as we've seen more information and, and also I just want to go back to, to Joe Dumars. I think he has unique credibility, I would say around the league that, you know, his, his championships as a player, his, his, his championships as, you know, as, as a GM, you know, as a leader of an organization, I think that Joe is in a position to command the kind of respect where when he's speaking directly to a team, even when he's speaking to the media and he can say, you know, and I, and I hear this in my head a lot that, you know, we are an 82 game league, you know, I, and you know, we have an 82 game season. Players are expected to play if they're healthy, not to roll the clock back, not to play when they're hurt. Right. I mean, he's yeah. like, and, and the other thing I'm learning and, you know, from, you know, our, our, our mutual friend, coach K that, it's not just leadership, but one thing, having been around him, particularly not just from my time at Duke, where I hardly knew the guy, but when from his coaching of the national team, is that the messaging and the consistency of the messaging is really important. And I think that's also where the league fell down a bit, because what I've heard um, directly from some of the players and even from our coaches, I'd say more in our teams, is that we in the league office, and this is what Joe has been doing and I've been trying to do as well, have to do a better job create, setting expectations because if you're not talking about it enough, and, and this goes back to my earlier issue about sort of back to basketball, my background at the league before I was the deputy commissioner of the league, I ran an, an entity here called NBA Entertainment. It's just what it sounds. I mean, I was not focused on the game itself. I was focused on the business around the game. And I, I think it's easy to get caught up in all the excitement. And it's part of our DNA, not just NBA Twitter, but when you think about the culture of this league, all the things you talk about in your podcast, the fashion, the food, the cities, you know, it's, it, it's part of what creates enormous interest in this league, but it's easy to forget that all of that interest only follows the game, the game, the game, <laughs> the game. And, and so I'm so glad you asked me these questions. And I think that we, the league then have to do a better job in saying, this is what our expectation is. I recognize Players and teams won't always meet that expectation, but it, it, it goes to that North star, even as you were saying in your own life, like, what do you think about when you wake up in the morning? And again, I'm, I'm learning on the job as I go, I've been with the league for a long time, but I, I, I love being part of this league and feel this enormous obligation again, to continue growing the game and, and to learn from, you know, what's happening in society at large, but also from mistakes I feel I've made along the way. Yeah. But let me just clarify, like when I read Joe's comments, I loved him. Yeah. I loved him. I mean, the, 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 the idea of a culture around an 82 game season, that's what the league is. I think back to my own career. It's like, I never started a season and be like, man, I really hope I get those 68 games in. No, it was like, <laughs> no, right. I want to play in every game. Right. Right. right? right that's right. like to your point, And I think this is really important. And I think sometimes even working in the media, I, I maybe lose sight of this on occasion. I think some media members lose sight of this a lot. I think some fans lose sight of this a lot. Like everything follows the game. 
The game, to your point about the North Star, the game is the North Star. That's what players ultimately love. Now, we certainly love some of the other stuff that comes with it, the economic benefits, uh, you know, the the celebrity, whatever you want to call it. Like there's there's other things that follow it, but it all starts with the game, right? And speaking of games. It's like, uh, it's the yeah. economy stupid or whatever Clinton, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. or James Carville famously said, yeah. right? And it's like back to first principles. First yes. principles. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, speaking of games, I am headed to Milwaukee later today to call uh, an in-season tournament group play game, uh, Knicks versus Bucks. Very excited about the game. Also, my first look at uh, Dame and Giannis together. Um as we as we go into these next uh, four to six weeks of in season tournament play, uh, do you have in your mind what a successful inaugural first in season tournament would would look like? Yes, I mean, and part of it is very specific in terms of a hope for a rating, a hope for fan interest, the way we can measure it on social media and other indicators. But more importantly, I think a buy in from the league. I think to the extent that players get up for those games, that the recognition that sure it's, it's, it, I think you, I, I heard you say the other day, they count double, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's still a regular season game yeah, yeah, that you should yeah. want to win, but it's, it's, it's a tournament and it's, it's an opportunity to win something. It's not the Larry O'Brien trophy and it won't, I doubt it'll take anything away from that because that's the apex. There's no question about it, but that here's an opportunity to win something that's, that's very significant to, um, the players, this NBA cup, something that's new, um, something that, uh, signifies, um, you know, accomplishment on the floor and, and, and the beginning of a new tradition in the league. And I'm particularly excited about it. I, I know, you know, back from your playing days, you were part of some of the early conversations when we were still, I think we used to call it mid-season tournament. Yeah, then mid-season, mid-season tournament. tournament. We, we, I was part of the conversations right. for the play-in, you know. Right. And, you know, and, and, and I think all these things, the, the play-in in many ways is working better than we expected it would. And just in terms of generating interest over the whole last month of the season. And I think for this in-season tournament, I mean, I, I love the marketing around it. I love the excitement we're starting to see anecdotally. I've, I've traveled a fair amount already in, in just the first couple of weeks of the season and talking to teams and players, they seem to be getting up for it. You know, I think some teams that are particularly competitive, you know, saying, Oh, you know, it's almost a reminder, man, I can't even wait till like the playoffs. You hear that a little bit. I'm like, Hey, don't forget about this in season <laughs> tournament guys are like, Oh yeah. yeah, no. And I, and I think, you know, yeah. a little bit, it's, it's, uh, I don't know if you've seen this already, but the, um, the international players, which are roughly a quarter of our league have more familiarity with these sort of cup tournaments because it's, we, we stole the idea from international soccer. And so they, they were quick to get it and, and also just understand the tradition that it's meaningful to win the FA cup or something like that, you know, in the English premier league. So they, I, I think they sort of have helped to spread the word to their teammates and around the league. So, I, so, you know, have fun calling that game. I mean, I, I, yeah. I, I think it's going to be fun. And, and I, part of it, people have seen already a lot of it through social media, um, a different look, you know, the, the, the floors, um, will be different colors, much more colorful, you know, hopefully it's, you know, obviously it's a television, very visual medium that for people to, as they're flipping the channel, say something's going on differently here, you know, it'll be the city edition uniforms premiered for the first time in these games, you know? So anyway, I'm, 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 I'm really encouraged, but by, by, by I had to do so an far. NBA media zoom yesterday for ESPN, just, you know, to, to talk about the in-season tournament and, and a couple of things that I said, it, number one, it's an event. The, the group play, they're all events. They got the special court, the, the special jerseys. Vegas is going to be an event. And and as a player, I th- I would think about events as exciting, right? I would get up even more than, than just a, a normal regular season game. Um, the other thing I said is there's enough uh, uber competitive guys in the league. You know, Chris, Chris, I said Chris Paul doesn't need a, a reason to wake up in the morning and be competitive. He just wakes up that way, you know. And there's enough guys in the league that have enough pride that – you probably, I would say, didn't even need to attach an economic incentive to this. How many options were on the table in terms of the incentive? Like, it, I saw some stuff on Twitter the other day about uh, the the winner should get at least a play-in spot or should be guaranteed maybe a top four seed home court, whatever it may be. 
those discussions around incentives, and obviously the union was involved in this, wh- wh- where did you sort of land on on this particular incentive? Where we landed, I mean, there, you could call them two categories of incentives. They're what you just touched on, which was should success in the in-season tournament have an impact on playoff standings, um, making the playoffs or you know, literally where you're seated. And ultimately the decision was, no, this should stand alone, especially in the beginning that whatever incentives exist. I mean, again, some of the original plans, these were additional games. So what, once we went to using regular season games for these in-season tournament games, I think you have an incentive, of course, to care about your regular season record. But the view was, let's keep the NBA playoffs independent other than whether you how these games count in, in your rankings for the playoffs, but create economic incentives. And I think those, those economic incentives, I think, you know, for players, they're significant. And, and beyond that, I think even the notion of this neutral site, I'm not sure I'm, we're allowed to use final four. I think somebody else owns that, but I'll call it, you know, (laughs) we call it the so-called final four in the office, but having a final four in Las Vegas, I think even for players to your point, like that's exciting. Like, I think, you know, you can speak this far better than I can, but, you know, one of the things I learned when I came to the league was that players don't look at things so much differently than fans. I think it surprises people sometimes, you know, that it's a lot of the same storylines in the locker room that are on ESPN. And when I've been talking to players around the league about this, they're like, ah, you know, Final Four in, in Vegas, that sounds like fun. <laughs> you know, I'd rather be part of it than not part of it. There's financial incentives as well. You can win a cup, you know, the NBA cup, it's the first ever, you know, in the season. It, again, I think there's, there's plenty to be excited about. You know, one sort of question for you, even just in your, in your Duke days, I know, of course, the goal is to win the NCAA championship or the ACC championship, but there were always a series of those other tournaments. I mean, I, I always say in addition to taking these ideas from, from international soccer, like it's, there's a long history in college basketball, it was the Thanksgiving tournament in the Bahamas or the holiday tournament, whatever. And it seemed that players, oh, it wasn't just the same if you were Duke as Wednesday night against Wake. You know, it was, it's a tournament. Let's go win it. No, it's a great point. I mean, we, we did preseason NIT uh, in, in Madison Square Garden. I thought, you know, for me, just the tradition of the ACC tournament, that felt like its own championship. Right. And of course, the NCAA way more important. Um, uh, Thanksgiving, I always, I always like to point this out. I think I was the only Duke player that never went to the Maui Invitational. <laughs> we got to go to Alaska in November with four hours of sunshine. So thank you for the scheduling people at Duke who made that happen for us. <laughs> Nothing against Alaska. Nothing against Alaska. This one goes out to all the NBA sickos out there. The NBA is in full swing, and there's no better way to feel a part of the basketball action than to play NBA 2K Mobile. Season 6 of NBA 2K Mobile is here with a new look, features, and gear. Take the action with you wherever you go. Join forces with your friends in cruise mode and dominate the court as a team. And speaking of, cruise mode has a whole new look. Plus, you get more customization options for your My Player, and you can play 1v1, 2v2, and of course, 3v3. I'm traveling a lot lately, and there's no better way to kill time than to play this game. I obviously love the tourney mode, but I'm sort of obsessed with all the events they do. Like right now, they are doing this fantasy finals where you only play the fourth quarters of games. It's awesome. And with Luca and Booker in my backcourt, I'm basically unstoppable. And best of all, it's free to play. So download NBA 2K Mobile free on the App Store or Google Play and use my promo code OLDMANJJ, Old Man JJ, to receive a Larry Bird Jade Tier card. Working on the media side now, um, I talked about this a bunch last year, in particular during the playoffs, where there was this uh, weird aha moment for a lot of fans, like, oh, Denver's good. Nikola Jokic is good. And, and this is this is a genuine question. I know I, 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 I sort of view, right, our, our, your, your broadcasting... Uh, par- as partners, right? The the ESPNs of the world, the Turners of the world. We're like we are partners of the league, um, and I don't know how much influence the league office has on the ancillary content around the broadcast. Right? There's there's the game broadcast, and then there's the ancillary content. But this is a genuine question. What do you think we in the media can do better about promoting the league as a whole versus what seems to me like promoting? five or six teams a season and five to 10 players a season. So 
number one, we have very little influence on the ancillary programming. And you can speak to that because, you know, now that you're part of that, I've never called you and said, no, no, no. I can't no, believe you're, right. you're talking about this well, or you're that. You're talking about yeah. ratings. We're talking right, about ratings. Right. Like we're, and, yeah, and so in real time. You yeah. guys, they, you know, despite what was written even about some talent changes at ESPN, the league does not have a say there. Um, where we do have a say is in the schedule itself. So there is a back and forth um, uh, between the networks and the league office on scheduling, on determining which teams to max out on. There's you know, for the listeners, the networks are limited by the number of times they can put each game, we put each team on. Of course, we're just talking about the regular season now. And often the push from the league is let's feature more teams. Because in part, uh, I see my goal as helping the league, I call it from, for shorthand, to become more NFL-like. And by that, I mean and, and this is changing in, in, in a very positive way. Of course, we've had five different teams win our, our finals in the last five years. But historically, I think if you asked some a casual fan, are you going to watch the NBA finals? They would say, well, who's going to be in it? And if you asked a casual NFL fan, are you going to watch the Super Bowl? They'd hardly ever say only if the Giants are in it. They'd be, it's a, it's a national holiday. And I think a part of, you know, my job is to take people who are fans of the game back to where we started and by definition create interest in whoever the teams are that are most successful because those are the teams that they, um, in addition to whoever their hometown fan is or whoever their personal uh, interest is, players and teams should think, I'm a fan of the game. This is the best basketball being played by definition because this team has gone to the conference finals or, or, or the finals. So I, like, so I think where we can all do a better job. And again, I'm not just pointing to the media here is talking more about the game. And I also, my frustration a bit, I think sometimes that the color commentary in our games gets reduced to, um, this team wanted it more, or, you know, this team tried harder, you know, as, as opposed to like, there's really complex defenses. Like what's the offense? Like, why is this team losing the way they are? Like, why is this team successful? Explain what the pick and roll is. Explain, you know, you know it's, it's funny as our friend, Chris Paul is always saying, you know, what does ice mean? What does blue mean? Like ex explain what's happening on the court, because I think there is this sense that unlike in football, where the coaches are view, viewed as these field generals going out there with the complex schemes. Then in basketball, there's a sense that it's just about athleticism, you know, or, you know, somehow, you know, the coach's job is just to get the guys to play hard, you know, as opposed to these. And again, you could speak so much better to this than I can, but these incredibly sophisticated um, defenses and offenses, I think just use another network example I think Kenny Smith, when he goes to that board, is a is a is a great example of helping explain the game um, visually, graphically to people to understand what's happening on the floor. So, again, not not necessarily knock on the media and of our partners because the league has to start with the league office. But let's talk more about basketball and then the other stuff. I'm fine with like have fun with the guys and you know the fashion show as the guys are walking into the arena. All that I'm not against it, but the game, the game, yeah. The debates around the goat and yeah, I, I, <laughs> I know exactly what you're talking. I was very, very happy. I uh, coached my son last night and I was very happy when I got home and Oklahoma city was hosting the new Orleans Pelicans last night. And I was like, this is great. These are two teams that I want to watch. There's a lot of exciting stuff happening there. CJ um, McCollum had a great game. Yeah. Great yeah, game. Yeah. Uh, big shot down the stretch. Uh, and to your point, uh, it, it's difficult, I think, on a broadcast, uh, unlike football, where there's sometimes there's 25 seconds between plays. It's difficult on a broadcast. You got to wait for a stoppage. You got to wait for a dead ball um, to really get into the weeds on some of the complexities of offensive and defensive coverages. But I would say to to any fan, uh, it is incredibly complex and there is a lot of sophistication. This is not a league at all where you just roll the ball out and go play. This is not pick up basketball. And I, and I think the complaint that bothers me sometimes is, especially in this three-point era, it's like, oh, they're just going down and jacking up threes. It's not really what it is. It's not really what it is. Um, and there's a simple way to break it down. We're not going to do it on this show. Um, one one very complex situation, and and I, I lived it. I was a part of it. 
Um, and it was roughly three months, I think, after you became commissioner, uh, was the Donald Sterling tapes that leaked um, prior to game four of our first round series against the Golden State Warriors. Um, and and look, I was involved with a lot of discussions with my teammates. I was not involved with discussions with other players around the league. And I was not involved with discussions with the league about what had to be done. And it seemed like at the time there was like a pretty harsh zero tolerance to, to what was said on those tapes. And I, I'm curious in your opinion, like how close were we to an actual walkout or boycott, not just of our team, because I I've heard, you know, since that series, of course, that perhaps the entire league was just going to walk out and, and boycott these games. The direct answer is I'm not sure. It just as a reminder to people of how quickly that all unfolded, that I heard that tape for the first time on a Saturday morning. I think it had been posted by TMZ literally in the middle of the night. Um and I banned Sterling for Life by Tuesday. And so I've watched, listened to some of the commentary about those four days now, in some cases, many years later, and at least me dealing with a real-time situation, it was not my sense that I was facing necessarily a league-wide boycott. And in fact, you know, Kevin Johnson at the time, who was the mayor of Sacramento, but was working closely with the Players Association, trying to work through this issue. Um, You know, Doc Rivers, others who I was talking to, there was more of a sense of partnership around it. I don't remember ever feeling threatened in a way where, and that's how some of the commentary reads now, that unless you do this, this is going to be the outcome. It felt more for me that, again, it was all happening so quickly. I was only had been the commissioner for two months at that time that I I was getting as much input as I could from people in the broader community. I was talking to players individually, um, other team governors, you know, the players association, but at the time it was really Kevin Johnson who was helping work through that on behalf of the players. And then a lot of other um, leaders um, who Again, because I was I was fairly inexperienced there, and whether it was my old boss David Stern checking in with him, but you know people like Ken Chenault, who was the CEO of American Express at the time, Bob Iger who was at Disney, and and what was interesting, as I asked others for advice, nobody said to me, "This is what you should do." People said, "This is the process I would follow." No, and and in part, I think nobody told me what to do because where I ultimately ended up with the ban for life, those are that's not. Um, a, a term of art in our NBA constitution. It seemed, it came, ultimately I decided that's what was appropriate. But most people who I was asking for advice from didn't know what my range of options were. And in fact, you know, it got very complicated, but I had the power as the commissioner to ban him for life, but I didn't have the power um, unilaterally to take away his franchise. Um, that can only be done. It's almost the equivalent of an impeachment process where there's a hearing in front of his fellow owners. They ultimately, it's, it's almost the equivalent of a trial, which would have to happen. And of course, what ultimately happened is his wife, Shelly, sold the team. So I'd only say, again, I was, I, was, I was definitely influenced by what I understood was a, the player reaction in a league that's 80% African-American to comments that that he made about black people in particular. So I was aware of all that, but I, the, the answer is, I don't know how close we were to potential boycott. I, I, my, my sense was, especially in the playoffs, talking to a lot of players, there was a sense like, this is unfair to us. Like I think for, to the extent you'll recall, there were some, you know, outside commentators who were telling the players they should be boycotting. And I think the sense from players was like, this is, a league problem. This is your job. You should be dealing with this. It's unfair to put us in the position and say, you know, unless, you know, we're not standing up for our community, unless we boycott, this is our lives. This is our livelihood. And, and I took that responsibility very seriously, but not to the extent that somebody was saying, and therefore you better do this. It was more, okay, you know, I'm new at this job. This is a a unique set of circumstances. And, um, 
it was getting a lot of obviously attention well beyond what was uh, specifically in our league. And it, and it felt like there was, there was an opportunity too to, to make clear what the values of this league were. Um, it's, a, it's interesting because that, a lot of that conversation that was happening with, you know, my friends across the league and within our locker room centered around that, like, this is unfair to us. We've worked our whole lives to get to this position where we're in the NBA playoffs playing. It's like, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be on us. I, look, I think to some degree that popped up again in the bubble uh, during those meetings, uh, in talk, I was not there. We had gotten eliminated, but in talking to players, like there was a sense there that, that, that was part of the conversation as well. And look, I, I just, I, I'm, you know, I can't put myself in your shoes completely, but I, I would imagine that you felt an immense amount of pressure to get it right, to get it right. And, and, and sort of on that note, cause you talked about earlier, just like not getting it right sometimes and, and dropping the ball in certain areas. Is there one thing, is there one uh, regret? I don't want to call it regret, actually. Is there one thing in your time as commissioner that you're like, you know what, I wish I would have done that a little differently? You know, I, I'm sure there is. Honestly, I'm, 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 there's so many things. I'm having trouble, like, on the spot, thinking something so specific that I would have done differently. Um, no, I, I, I mean, I, 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 if, 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 if you reminded me of some things that I've done, do you remember but, back in te- 2017? <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm saying like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a second guesser. Yeah. Like Cause my I, one thing, if I was to give one critique of the job and this isn't on just on you, my one thing is everybody in that class of 2016 really just, they made it and everybody else that wasn't a top tier player got screwed. That was the only thing. But a lot of that was on the union, right? We talked about this as players, as unions. That was that was the only thing. You're talking about the smoothing issue. The smoothing but, issue but, versus well, that's one. That's yeah. one I won't put on my list because we wanted to smooth. You, you the guys increase. suggested yeah. the smoothing. You know, yeah. One thing, I'll, a quick one, just as I'm thinking about it. I think the postseason awards um, didn't work. Where we tried to shift all and have a have an award show postseason. I mean, that's not a, top of most people's list, but I think that was something we tried that wasn't particularly effective. But, but as I started to say, I mean, I, I'm constantly second guessing myself. I'm sure even I, I won't necessarily listen to this interview <laughs> because I lived it, but I'm sure there's something that I said that I'm going to say, why did I say it that way or whatever? I mean, it's just sort of, I, I, when I hear people say they have no regrets, I never can believe it. Yeah. I mean, I'm full of regrets. Oh, sure. Sure. And, and look, I, I think the evidence has shown this, uh, that, that you are malleable in your decision making. Uh, the All Star Game this year is exa- a great example. That we're going back to East West. You know, we're not doing the draft anymore. I love it. And look, we talked about the in season tournament. I'm sure there'll be some tweaks on that going forward. We're going to see how this year plays out. I'm very excited about it. But you've always shown that ability to to be malleable. And one thing I want to mention quickly around All Star, and again, to, to the extent that I listen to commentary, one of these um, points came directly from you. And that was talking about the fanfare around All-Star and saying, how does the league expect the players to go out and play as if it's a real game and putting aside the parties, but even when the... the, There's a concert beforehand. There's a concert, the intros go on, they're standing there and all that. And in fact, sort of under the steam back to basketball, and I think even going to the heartland of basketball in Indiana and going to Indianapolis this year for the All-Star game. And this came directly from discussions with players, which was, all right, we get it. Like nobody was happy about the experience last year. No one at all. You know, we're, and it's not Joe Dumars or me necessarily saying, we expect you to be playing like it's the finals, but we need a game. And I think what we got back from the players, fine though, but then you got to let us run through our typical routines. This is how we prepare for games. And if you're going to have us do a quick shoot around and stand there for 20 minutes while you do these really fancy intros as much as everybody might love them, then you can't also expect us to play a game. And I, that's where a sort of a rebalancing at the league is necessary, which is it's great. You know, we love all the sort of the entertainment side, the sizzle around the league, but if basketball is what's most important, that that's at the center of these concentric circles of, of, of what we value, then players should be able to go through their normal routines. We can't, you know, maybe we can, extend halftime two minutes, but not 10 minutes, you know, because 
as again, as you well know, you're 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 accustomed to a certain routine. Your body is loaded to perform in a certain way. And so, you know, and whether that's in, in the category of, of regrets, I think that's one where it was kind of like a slippery slope. You just, every year there becomes less emphasis on the game itself. Right. And wasn't it great? You guys do these, this fancy technology summit on Friday and you have a uh, newsmaker breakfast and you have, you know, all kinds of, we had a big uh, seminar on Africa last year and the league we creating there things of enormous interest to the people who are, who were there at, at Salt Lake city for the game. But then it's a reminder to us when the weekend is over and you're looking at the, the post weekend commentary, 95% of it is about the game, not about, Oh, wasn't that a great party Friday night? <laughs> you know? And, and that's, there's just a realization that especially where 99% of the imagery for our game is, is delivered through media. It's not through the in-person experience, which might be very enjoyable for the people there that back to first principles again. Yeah. Back to basketball. I love it. Very excited for the season. Adam, can't thank you enough for the time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, JJ. All right.